Um, hello, everyone. And the live streaming has now started for this meeting. Um, we don't have the chair or vice chair present at the moment. So if we can please appoint a chair for this meeting only, do we have any nominations? Councillor Layton. Uh, could I nominate Councillor Newell? Is that seconded? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so uh, before we do start, um, I'd just like to confirm that this is an informal meeting um, and I will be taking notes of the meeting and these will be ratified at the next in-person meeting. Um, I'll hand over to you then, Councillor Newell. Sorry, you're on mute, Councillor Newell. I was rattling away there. <laughs> no, I um, just wondered if we needed to make a round of introductions. There are some people here that I've never met before, and I'm sure other members may not have met. So I just wondered if we could have some introductions, please. I'm can... wanting you all. Sorry, do you want me to read out the names? Yes, then... if you would, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah, that would be okay. great, Hannah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Councillor Newell. Um, We've got Councillor Heslop. Hi there. Uh, Councillor Layton. And Councillor Lee. And in terms of um, officers, we have got Lisa Ward. Hi. Um, we've got Warren Edge. Uh, we've got Jennifer, Ill Jennifer Illingworth. Morning. Dr. Chris Lanigan. Uh, we've got Avril Lowry and we've got Laura Kirkbride. I think that's everyone. Okay. Can I just jump in there, Wendy? I I've just been trying to get hold of our lot and uh, I've just had the message to say that he's, uh, Ian has signed off work. He, he, as well oh, right. Knows, okay. Been, yeah. He has been ill and it's obvious that it's, it's, his illness is continuing. Yes. OK, thank you very much for that, Councillor Lee. Do we have any apologies, Hannah? Um, I have apologies from Councillor Wright. OK, thank you. Um, any declarations of interest, anybody? No. OK, as a no. So the next item on the agenda is uh, County Room and Darlington NHS Foundation Quality Account. And uh, who's going to present that? Um, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Warren Edge, and I'm uh, the Trust Senior Associate Director of Assurance and Compliance. I'll be presenting this item okay. with with Lisa, uh, Lisa Ward. Um, so my side of things is really the the data trends and assurance, and Lisa's is the much more interesting bit in terms of the actual improvement work that we're doing um, and the clinical work that we're doing in each of these areas. So we'll do a double head as we go through. Okay. Um, if, you, if you bear with me, I'll attempt to share the slides. So, okay, has that come through okay? I've got it. Has everybody else got it? Yes. Yes, thank yes. you. Yes, yes, it would seem so. Thank you. And and can I check before we start how, how long were you expecting us to talk for? Because I certainly don't want to to go over. I know you have other items of business. Mm -hmm. um, have Have you got any um, time slot allocated, Hannah? No, I, I no. mean half an hour, twenty I, minutes. I would have thought. Yeah. I would have thought. Excuse me, twenty minutes, half an hour would be okay. fine if that's okay with you. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so excuse me. first of all, just to say where where we are as a trust in terms of our quality strategy and the setting of, of quality priorities. So um, we have had a, a quality strategy called Quality Matters um, in place for some time. Um, it ran and ran out essentially at the start of um, 2021. Uh, and due to um, the pandemic, we put a one year uh, plan in place. Uh, to keep things going in terms of bringing forward the priorities and objectives that we hadn't previously achieved. 
Uh, we have been going through for the last few months a, a fairly extensive internal consultation exercise uh, with our staff, um, but also with patients in terms of what our quality strategy should look like for the next three years. That's the, the big quality matters conversation as our communication guys like to brand it. Um, so what we, we set out within our quality count last year was really a set of interim priorities for 20. 21, 22, and that's what we'll talk to you about today. Um, but um, just to make you aware that that bigger piece of work is going on in terms of um, setting the strategy um, for future years, and we will shortly consult with external stakeholders, including yourselves, uh, in respect of that bigger piece. So these were the, the interim priorities that we set out in our uh, quality accounts for uh, last year to. Um, to cover us for 2021, 22, uh, and we'll take each of these in turn. Um, so starting with with falls, um, our overall aim is is to minimise the risk of falls and to reduce the harm uh, that that patients get from falls. Um, so as I suggested earlier, I'll start with the the trend information, the insurance information, and no doubt Lisa will pick up in terms of um, the clinical work that we've been doing in the improvement work. So at the headline level, um, if we look at rolling averages, then from last year to this year, we have been successful in terms of seeing a lower number of falls overall per thousand bed days. So that's linking it to, to activity. So the, uh, you can see there is 6.3 um, for acute hospitals and 7.1 in our community hospitals compared to 6.8 and, and 8 in terms of last year um, and I'll when I skip over to the next slide in a moment you can see what last year looked like um, it's 2021 in terms of the trend uh, and how it was much higher than um, the trend that we've seen um, in 21-22. The, the graph on the right hand side may look a bit complicated but to keep it as simple as possible the green zone in the middle is what was normal for us before the pandemic um, normal fluctuation in terms of the, the number of falls per thousand bed days every month. Um, and the trend line in the middle is, is actually showing you that by and large, we've remained within those parameters uh, this year, um, even though we've continued to have complications from COVID-19 and demand pressures. Um, however, we have had a couple of months where we've gone uh, just outside of that, hence the, the red line because we would want to get a green line, we'd want it there uh, throughout the whole year. Um, I'll just jump forward and show you what the previous year looked like. So you can see um, what what the overall trend looks like over the two years and that reduction that I've talked about. And then I'll pause and let Lisa pick up some of the improvement points. So if I do jump forward, you could, that is the, the trend for 2019, hence you can see if, if, um, if the first um, half of that um, shows you that, that we were within that normal zone for 1920, because that's how we define normal. But if you then look to the right hand side, you can see how we were always above it uh, with some real spikes in 2021, which coincided with with the major waves of the pandemic. So if you then if you take the two together, you can see that actually um, we're, we're in a better position this year because we've come back down to what was what, what was in our, our sort of normal zone previously. Um, and I'll pause there because uh, Lisa can pick up and talk about um, the progress that we made in terms of actually minimising the harm um, from those falls and the improvement work. Lisa? Uh, sorry, Lisa, can I just ask, do sorry. you want to take questions at the end of each priority or at the end of the whole presentation? Or as we go along, I'm happy to either. Uh, I'm Lisa. I'd be happy to go at the end of each priority. Okay. Yeah. Members okay with that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sorry. That's great. That's helpful, Lisa. So as, Warren, as Warren said, we've um, done quite a lot of work on falls this year. To put into background, give you a bit of background as to what's happened in March. You might remember Joanne told you she was retiring this time last year, so we lost Joanne. And now Falls League retired as well. So um, for all that was sad that we lost our Falls League, it was at the end of the three year strategy, but it also brought fresh eyes in at the start of the year and new ideas, which is always good. 
So we've, we've got a new strategy, which has just been um, agreed and published. One of the things that we're looking at um, in the strategy for the first year, which is Warren sort of alluded to slightly there, is we are reducing our falls with harm. We will have some falls in hospital that we absolutely can't avoid. And when we do the review, we can see there was nothing else the staff could have done to prevent that fall happening. So what we're trying to do is unpick the data back for a few years to see if we can get a baseline of that data to try and demonstrate as well that we're reducing the number of avoidable calls with severe harm. So we're working with Warren's team to get that data as well, because it'll give you a much richer understanding as well and help us delve into it a bit more. One of the things the new team has done is a rapid review process. So I'm sure um, you'll have heard us talk in the past. If we have an incident in the organisation, we do a root cause analysis which involves getting everyone in a room, sitting around a table and, and discussing the incident that's happened. One of the things that we've done is try to like pull that forward. So we're doing a rapid review. So our falls team will go into the ward where it happened. Within, they try and do it within five days of the fall occurring. So this means it's really fresh in the staff's minds. It means they can talk to the patient as well, which is really key to so the patient. Like sometimes it's not appropriate because the patient might not really have the capacity to speak to them about it, but often they do. And they can give them a bit of context about what happened or how they feel about it. So we can we can really um, bring the patient into our reviews. It also allows us to pick up maybe the little finer bits of learning that we might not, that might be almost um, not seen a few weeks further down the line that people might not think are relevant so it picks them up and it also allows us to get learning back into the clinical area in the context of that patient who the staff know quite quickly which helps them remember a lot better the learning so that's it's working really well the rapid review process the staff really like it the team really like it so it's really positive the other thing we're doing we're currently recruiting a quality improvement lead which is it's a post that sort of sits between Warren's team and my own team. So I am using the data that we've got to really drive quality improvement. So it's a bit of a proof of concept, I think it would be fair to say, isn't it, Warren, in the first instance? So we've got one 22 and a half hour post out to advert at the moment. I think my hope is that it will lead to something more and we'll really be able to prove the, the benefit of this person. So for the first year, that post is very much going to be on uh, focused upon falls so the where we can see that there's a quality improvement project we could do on award and the quality improvement nurse will go in and um support the ward in doing it but one of the things we want to do sometimes um when we work in huge organizations it can feel a bit done unto i.e we're saying you've got a problem with falls this is what you need to do to improve it but actually there's a real desire amongst the staff on the shop floor to actually drive that quality improvement and own it. But obviously, they're very, very busy looking after our patients and don't necessarily always have the time to understand the data or run a proper quality improvement project unsupported. So this role is not about going in and doing the quality improvement project. It's really empowering the nurses on the shop floor to be able to do the project themselves. We've um, run a project up at Durham, which has nothing to do with falls, but it was about um, water jugs. And I'm probably... It'll, comes into a later slide but it was about traffic like water jugs whereby the patients start the day with a red lid on their water jug when they've drank that lid they get an amber lid when they get drank the third when they're onto their third jug they get a green lid and it's about hydrating our patients sufficiently mm. and um one uh, one of the acute intervention team actually managed that project and it was very much if you go to that ward at durham now that ward at Durham State was their project, they owned it, they did all this amazing work. And that's really uh, what we're trying to achieve with this post so that the quality improvement projects are owned by the wards and driven and that will help us sustain them. So, but as I say, in the first year, the quality improvement person will um, focus specifically on falls to really try and get us under um, some of the big themes that we've got out there that we can do some improvement work around. Thank you very much, Lisa. Do any members have any questions? No? Sounds good. OK, thank you. OK, so if, if I move on to uh, healthcare acquired infections and um, in terms of the priorities that we set within the quality accounts, um, we focused on um, MRSA, bacteria, bacteremia and Clostridium difficile infections um, we didn't set ourselves a, any particular target around um, COVID-19 
because um, it was very unpredictable in terms of whether there would be further waves and what was involved. But I have got some um, information for you around that, um, which I will come on to. Um, but starting with the two infections that we did include in our priorities, um, we have had four cases of MRSA bacteremia um, against our um, zero tolerance within the trust. Last year we had five, so we're on a, a similar trajectory. Um, every one of those cases is is reviewed in detail um, to identify uh, if we have specific learning points and if we are getting um, themes arising in relation to um, particular cases. Um, we don't have any um, recurrent themes arising from those, but each of, each of them has individual uh, learning points. Um, in terms of, of, of screening, um, sampling uh, et, uh, and the management of the infection. And they're all followed through. Um, for Clostridium difficile, um, we're actually, uh, if we run forward to December, because we've just confirmed the December figures, so that chart takes you to, to November. As of December, we're still at 35. Um, and we, we have a national threshold it's not a target it's a it's a it's a, it, it, it's a threshold um set in terms of a maximum by nhs england improvement that is 45 for the year as a whole um so if you plot that out month to month then we would be hoping to be around no more than 34 at the end of december so we are we're close um but not exactly where we want to be um last year we had 49 over the year as a whole so we have made some slight improvement and a lot of work has gone into this with the, our infection prevention and control team. They, they, they go out on, onto, onto wards and into clinical areas and, and train people in situ doing something called a topic of the month um, and reinforcing good practice in, with respect to um, screening, sampling, um, isolation, et cetera, um, is something that they've done. Um, through that that process, picking up any themes from the review of each um, case of Clostridium difficile. We do know, because we have comparative data, that um, all trusts have seen some challenge in terms of, uh, of holding rates of Clostridium difficile uh, as low as they used to be um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we think that is related in, to some extent to obviously the increased use of antibiotics to manage the symptoms of COVID-19 because um, additional prescribed antibiotics can, can trigger the way the, the, um, the infection lives in the gut uh, and, um, uh, and expose patients to it. So uh, that, is a, that is definitely a trend that you, we could observe regionally and nationally. Um, We've reviewed our, um, as we said we would do in the document that we issued for last year, we've reviewed our blood culture policy in line with national guidance. And as I've mentioned, the topic of the month training. Um, in terms of COVID-19, as I say, we didn't set ourselves any particular targets because it was it was still very um, a very uncertain picture when we drafted them. Um, but I can, um, in terms of your scrutiny, uh, provide an assurance that we have followed all of the um, practices that are recommended by NHS England Improvement in their guidance. And there is something called a, a infection prevention control assurance framework that we've updated um, four times now. I think it is and taken through our quality committee and the board. We've had their own infection control lead from the region come in and our, our I think he's now he has visited all our main sites, uh, including Darling Donington Memorial Hospital, but you, Durham and Bishop Auckland as well, um, to give his independent observations. Um, he he's confirmed that we are following good practices in many areas, um, and as you would expect him to do, and we wanted him to do. He's challenged us um, in terms of those areas where our operating conditions are not ideal. So. Um, we would like more isolation rooms, uh, but our hospital was built in the 1970s um, and we don't have the luxury of being able to um, convert a lot of accommodation to uh, to single rooms um, very easily. We would like um, better access to mechanical ventilation in all areas um, rather than relying on natural ventilation and 
um, we would um, like to um, to have in the nicest possible way um, a healthy population, um, fewer uh, fewer patients um, and bed pressures than we see sometimes because it's it's the need to move patients that also increases this risk. So he's he's pushed us quite hard and made some very helpful observations around that, and therefore we we have a, a whole project team leading uh, five different strands of work um, to um, to optimise what we're doing in, in each of those areas. So just to give you one example of that, we um, we know we can't rely on natural ventilation windows, et cetera, uh, around hospital bays in, in winter. And in, in, in areas that are have less space uh, and are busier, such as the bays in um, uh, one of our acute medical units, we're, we're um, procuring and putting in HEPA filtration devices that have been tested elsewhere that essentially clean the air. Um, so I'll pause there because that's the end of, of infections. If there are any questions or if Lisa wants to add anything. No. Anybody got any questions on this particular priority? OK, right. Okay. For um, Care of patients with dementia, there's a number of things that, that we've been trying to do, particularly around um, relaunching um, awareness of dementia and, and relaunching the roles of um, our um, dementia lead dementia nurse and the dementia link nurses, which were um, impacted in 2020 by the pandemic in terms of um, time, though, t from time to time, those individuals were, were redeployed to um, support the frontline effort. Um, so we, we've we been uh, doing a lot of work in terms of um, re-raising awareness of those roles, but that is something that needs to, to continue. Um, we have relaunched things like John's campaign, the use of care of passports, and, and this is me documentation. Um, not that people stopped using it, but it, it, again, it's people haven't had training on this for, uh, you know, for a year or two because of the pandemic. So again, it's making sure that, that people are aware of the, the importance of using that documentation and, and liaising with carers um, and making sure you we really understand the patient as an individual and look after them. Uh, we have a quarterly newsletter um, that, that shares learning and celebrates um, the good stuff. Lisa will say more about that later on generally, but I'll, um, we do that um, in terms of uh, ra that awareness raising overall. Um, we did intend to audit our environment as part of the um, the, the uh, patient-led assessment process place visits um, because we we planned from 2019 to make some further improvements in that environment um, and we'd want to to validate those improvements. However, um, those visits remain stood down. They were st um, stood down last year and they've now been stood down again um, in terms of uh, this year because of, of the Omicron wave. Um, uh, happy to take any questions on dementia. Anybody got any questions? You got any comments, Lisa? No, I think Warren's covered all that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Pressure ulcers is uh, continues to be uh, one of our success stories. Um, it's not achieved without an awful lot of, of vigilance and hard work um, from. The teams on the ground so we have a zero uh, tolerance for um, pressure ulcers that, that result from any lapse in care um, and it, we aim to have no category three or four pressure ulcers um, in terms of the, the, the grade of damage that involve um, lapses of care and we I'm pleased to say that we're, we're meeting that ambition in the year to date. I think last year we only had one so we're, we're continuing um, to uh, you know to operate processes that are now very well embedded um, and, and help us to get the result that we want. Um, we do track other types of pressure damage and there has been, there was one serious incident of the year that involved some deep tissue damage. Um, that was immediately um, reviewed and acted upon, um, both in terms of the uh, the frontline staff in the, in the care group and on the ward, uh, but also with the support of, of, of Lisa's team um, to make sure that we got uh, rapid learning and action in respect of that. Um, essentially, it was um, 
it, it did involve a lapse in some of um, some of the practices that we should have been following in terms of things like um, body mapping, but um, that was all very rapidly reinforced and, and we haven't had any re recurrence. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on that, Lisa, if we have any questions. Not really, just to reinforce what you've said there, I think, Warren, is that the team got into the, the clinical area very quickly to support the clinical teams with where the lapses were to correct them. And I think the tissue viability team are incredibly proactive about yeah. Always thinking where we are now, but thinking one step ahead. So what else can they do to take us to an even better place? I think it would be fair to say. Carol, uh, the lead nurse, her brain is full of ideas all the time of, of what she can do, which is really great. OK. Um, Councillor Layton. Uh, thank you. I just actually it wasn't a question. It was more a comment. And um, I'm just remembering back to when I did my nurse training back in the mid 90s and the um, advances um, in um, sort of skin patency and body mapping. And uh, sort of it's just remarkable. You know, if if somebody said presented that report in 1994 saying that you had one incident you know people would have just been absolutely would be on the floor fainting because it's just uh, it's made so many um advances and it's uh, it's a wonderful thing because it does have such an impact on people's health and so i just like to compliment uh, all those concerned thank you, thank you. are people happy for me to move on yeah. to everybody uh, okay yeah Next priority. Um, so this one isn't quite such a success story. Um, so this is um, issuing electronic discharge letters to um, our GP colleagues um, within 24 hours. Um, we have traditionally um, hit around 92%, although we still push ourselves to achieve what used to be set as the national target of 95%, recognising the, the importance of timely information to GPs in the handover of care. Um, you can see that that continued to be the um, the position um, in respect of uh, the first half of the year. Um, but then as we, we picked up um, demand pressures in the second half of the year, um, including um, um, a sort of mini wave of COVID in the autumn, uh, that um, deteriorated slightly. Um, one of the things that we are currently uh, working on um, is a, a major initiative called Workers One, um, which uh, it's very far reaching. So it just doesn't only cover discharge, it, it covers um, how we we um, admit patients, how we manage their flow through A&E and how we manage the flow through the hospitals as a whole. But there is a very, very big focus on uh, the whole discharge process within that initiative, increasing the role of discharge uh, facilitators, um, reviewing all our uh, discharge processes and optimising them uh, with um, an emphasis on, on gathering data and specifically measuring how we're doing against it. We've only been running it since December, so we don't have um, data to share with you at, at the moment. Um, but within the, the metrics that we're measuring as part of Workers One, um, we are including the timeliness of discharge information. Um, so that's the vehicle through which we are trying to pick up the, the, the fall off in performance and drive it back up again. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Because um, I'll bring them in because I have a comment to make on this particular priority. Anybody? <laughs> Sorry. OK, I, I was discharged at the end of March last year from DMH with a really comprehensive discharge letter. Um, and when I contacted my GP to get some repeat medication, they had not received it. Ah. They had no copy. So I phoned DMH, then I phoned the surgery, then I phoned DMH. And, and it, it really was quite stressful because it wasn't well. And in the end, my son took me down to the surgery so they could photocopy my discharge letter. And when I asked why was why could this not have been sent electronically when I first raised the issue, I was told the letters were delivered by courier. Uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that was your your experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, it certainly shouldn't shouldn't have happened that way. Um, and and I I would um, hope because we we would and Lisa would confirm that we would log anything we're aware of like that as an incident and look into it. Um, I'd need to um, to to look at the specific details as to uh, as to why 
that happened and also check with colleagues on, on the actual uh, process around it. So are discharge letters delivered by courier? So there's a there's um, there's a two stage process. So there's the um, immediate information um, and essential information which is uh, sent um, within 24 hours, mm, and that's yeah. done. Now that's done by electronic yes. means, um, and and that's the kind of safety netting around that essential information. Occasionally, as you can see, we don't always get it done in 24 hours, and occasionally we do get some glitches in terms of the ability of the GP practices to pick that up on their systems. We we look into every one. Um, the uh, formal discharge letters to the GPs. I would need to conf confirm for you, Councillor Newell, but I, I, I think they, they go by courier or by, by post in terms of the more detailed letter. OK, thank you. Um, it's just that we, we as a scrutiny committee have always um, had concerns that the targets haven't been met. And it, when you experience something yourself, it, mm. it brings it uh, more to the fore. So thank you very much for that. I don't want it investigating. I just wanted to comment on it. OK. okay? Um, I'm not that close to that process, though. So uh, what I will do is I will confirm my understanding. Mm. And if it is slightly different, I will uh, send something in writing through okay. Hannah for the okay. record. Thank you very much. OK, uh, now I am going to defer to Lisa on this one because she is much mm. closer to what the work we're doing on sepsis than I am. OK, so um, obviously our aims last year were to improve the percentage of patients receiving antibiotics within an hour in the emergency department. Obviously, um, as you're all aware, it's very well publicised um, over the last few months is exactly how busy our emergency departments have been. So it's quite a challenge um, to really get those antibiotics into the patient within an hour. But we are striving to do it. We're continuing to audit. One of the things we're doing to support that, which is sort of jumps onto the next section a little bit, is we've developed a PGD, um, which is a patient group directive. And this is a very clear, for those of you who um, haven't ever worked clinical, um, this is a very clear set of instructions to the nursing staff as to in what circumstances they could give uh, uh, antibiotics to a patient without a doctor having seen them. So that means that at the point that they assess a patient, they would be able to feel that the patient had sepsis and then deliver antibiotics themselves, which would really support us in getting the antibiotics into the patient within an hour. So that PGD has been developed. It's been uh, we did that collaboratively with our pharmacy. And we're actually piloting that in the Darlington Emergency Department currently to see if that helps us. Um, we've also developed a simulation study Wednesday, and this is part of really improving staff awareness. Now, we again, this was in collaboration with Darlington A&E in the first instance. Now, simulation, for those of you who aren't aware, it's where we've got what's called high fidelity mannequins, and they're at our Bishop Auckland, Bishop Auckland Simulation Centre. And it's sort of set up like a hospital room where you can make it feel like an emergency department room, and it moves in real time. So the nurse would go in and they would look after this patient in real time and assess them and decide what they need to do. There's obviously a lot of education wrapped around that. There's a lot of lectures before they get to the bit where they do simulation. Now, it's something that's really been embedded in medical training for many years. But for nurses, we haven't really we don't really use it that much. And it's just something that we're starting to try and use a lot more. It's been really well received by the nurses in the ED at Darlington. And before we've even been able to evaluate it or go to Durham ED to say, what do you think of this? Durham ED have come knocking at our door. So I think that's really positive because, you know, they've obviously heard word of mouth. So we're actually now putting the um, the Durham staff through that. So we've delivered three to date, which isn't a lot. But then if, if we reflect back on the context in which we're delivering it, it's quite challenging to get the staff off the shop floor to get them into the training. Because um, obviously, as, as you know, as you see in the news, it's really like we're under a lot of pressure at the moment um, from COVID. So, so that's really positive. The other thing that we've done is appointed a lead sepsis nurse in post. Now, you might a number of years I came to talk to you, I think, about sepsis specifically. Um, but what we and we did temporarily have quite a junior sepsis nurse. She was a like a sis, at sister level. Um, but unfortunately, um, when she left, we didn't we didn't have the funding to continue that post. But what we've done now is we've put actually a matron in post who looks after our acute intervention and a cardiac arrest prevention team. 
and she's our lead sepsis nurse. We've got that really high profile senior nurse to lead this piece of work. Um, some really exciting stuff that we haven't got on here necessarily, but I'd like to share with you is um, you'll remember in the past we did, and I think actually some of you might have come to the hospital to see Paul Latimer, um, to see it in Nerve Centre, how we did sepsis screening and that. So when we set a set of OBS up, yeah, Mm -hmm. it automatically screens the patient for sepsis. Well, as you may or may not be aware, we are uh, implementing an electronic patient record and, we're in, and that'll be coming in later this year. So we're in the stage where we're localising that and making sure it's it's got everything in that we need. So we obviously transferring across this automated screening into the new electronic patient records, but it's allowing us to take it one step further as well. So once we've screened for sepsis, we uh, recognise that the patient is sepsis on that system from a set of OBS. It pushes us into what's called the sepsis six, which is your six priorities when a patient is um, has sepsis that you need to deliver within that hour, fluids as well as antibiotics as other things. And it pushes the staff into that, which is, is like a gap that we don't have now. So that's really exciting. So that's another supportive thing for the staff that will be able to expose that care plan for them and and get them to do it straight away so so that's really positive thank you has anybody got any questions can i can i just say um i was one of the members who came to speak to paul latimer about sepsis uh, screening i um, found it very very interesting because the committee was at the time doing a piece of work on sepsis and i'm really pleased to see that you're moving this forward and that, you know, progress that, that could potentially be made there. So thank you very much. And I think probably there's an opportunity once we get our electronic patient record in and get a couple of months to draw a breath for you to come back and see yeah. how we've transferred across yes. and built on what we've done in Nerve Centre. Because obviously I know there's lots that we did in Nerve Centre that you saw and we can show how we've developed on that. That will be really good um, when it's convenient. So uh, Hannah, could you make a note of that, please? Yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got somebody else's hand up, but I don't know who it is. To me, I think, uh, Wendy. Oh, uh, Councillor uh, Lee. Yeah. Um, hello. Quite fascinating. Can you just remind us just how many cases of sepsis we have in the hospitals now? Is it a rising trend or a steady trend or, a, you know, given, given these uh, additional support mechanisms you are putting into reducing or treating sepsis? Is, are they having any effect? So they, um, I can't answer off the top of my head the number of sepsis, but I can come back to you and I can get you that data because I, I, I genuinely can't remember off the top of my head how many we have a month. And I couldn't tell you what the trend is, to be honest. Um, I think the trend is pretty static, but I would have to confirm that to you. But we monitor it. It gets reported monthly by the cardiac arrest prevention team. And I haven't had it escalated to me that it's going up or we have a, prob a particular problem with sepsis. So, so that would lead me to think it's static, but I will have to come back to you and confirm that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, are we happy to move on? Yeah. OK, Fine. Yeah. thank you. Um, so for nutrition, um, what you can see um, from the chart, um, we we carry out audits every month as part of our warden team audits. Um, you don't get a green unless you're scoring 90% in terms of complying with our procedures. Um, and you can see that the trend over overall tr for the trust every month has been in that green zone and above the 90%. And that's not necessarily the case in terms of total consistency between wards and teams um, and of everyone hitting that 90%. Um, we were contemplating and we said in, in the document last year that we were looking to reconstitute our nutrition steering group. Um, we haven't tackled the issue in that way, given uh, the, the need to, to balance how we're using our resources for pandemic and other priorities. Instead, what what we've done is very focused work led by the deputy director of nursing and the head of dietetics with with those teams going out to support those wards um, and teams. And we've we've seen um, from when that work took place around June July last year um, an uplift uh, in uh, uh, and and much better consistency of people hitting the ninety percent over the second half of the year. Um, 
The other thing that, that's now well embedded um, it is the role of the two um, acute kidney injury nurses that we've, we've appointed, one on each site. Um, and then, again, Lisa's closer to that than me, so I'm sure she will want to add. Yeah, um, so as Warren says, they're well embedded, our AKI nurses. They, they actively, proactively seek out patients who have a diagnosed with an acute kidney injury in hospital. And they also support the um, tertiary centres, so our renal centres at South Tees and um, Sunderland in looking after any patients that are known to them that are in our care. The other thing that we've got now is renal inreach. So the AKI nurses look after these patients on a day-to-day -day basis and um, the renal inreach consultants come over once a week and then they go and see any patients that the AKI nurses want them to go and see. So that's really positive got that at both sites now and I think I'm just going to blow their trumpet here and then I'll shut up is that um, they have just been shortlisted for an HSJ award for the work that they've done um, with reducing our acute kidney injuries in hospital so that's really positive so you'll have to all keep your fingers crossed that um, we win that award. Okay. Anybody got any questions here? Okay thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of end of life and palliative care, um, left hand column in the table are the four things that we said we would do um, moving forward in, into 21-22 in our last quality account. Um, refreshing the, the palliative care strategy has been um, delayed by pandemic priorities, but we have worked with partners um, in terms of the T's wide strategy development. Um, Recognition of of of, of people uh, in the end of in their end of life um, stages in hospital, um, we could we put a lot of effort and training in, into that uh, from the end of life team, um, and we we've used um, COVID essentially as as a way of looking at how well um, that trait that training and understanding is becoming embedded. Um, with the audit data that, that the team collects, um, showing actually that it's it. It's very good overall. Ninety percent uh, of all um, patients in that situation were recognised. Um, exploring solutions to the lack of single rooms. I've already um, alluded to the fact that um, um, both of our hospitals uh, are old to different degrees, um, and we we don't have the sing number of single rooms that we would want. Actually, at Darlington, though, we do pretty well overall uh, in getting patients. Uh, at end of life into single rooms 88 um, percent and we know that because again we, we're auditing our compliance with that it is more of a challenge at Durham uh, and our doc care after death documentation um, has been um, overhauled um, and fully a new checklist in place and fully rolled out uh, to make sure that um, uh, we continue to um, to fulfill our responsibilities um, to patients even when they're no longer with us Lisa was the uh, as uh, the new chair of our end of life steaming group. Is there anything you want to add there? Just to add the end of life at uh, the end of life. Sorry, the palliative care team have been really, really involved in uh, the EPR localization work we're doing to make sure that the electronic patient record really helps guide the staff. So obviously we've got that um, checklist for patients who are ill enough to die. But then how do we incorporate the prompts that we might need for the staff into our uh, EPR? One of the things that we built actually since. Um, I don't think you'll probably know about it, is a, what we would describe as an observation module in Nerve Centre, which is for end-of-life observations. It's been developed by our palliative care team and we've implemented it in Nerve Centre. And it, it provides a score for the patient, but it's got decision support for the staff and it's, it's, the staff absolutely love it. And interestingly, we're getting a lot of um, interest nationally of people asking how we've done it. I had a meeting with Newcastle on Monday because that's the second meeting I've had with them because they're wanting to try and implement it at Newcastle. And it's how do we do that? <clears throat> um, and we've actually been um, successful in getting a, we got Lucy, the palliative care consultant, and myself are going to speak at a, a national digital conference about the work that we've done with comfort observation. So that's actually really uh, positive and it's it's it is really making a difference for our patients we feel as well so, so that's positive okay thank you anybody got any questions on this council Layton. Uh, thank you um i was just wondering if you have any way of um 
sort of monitoring the sort of links you have with um, care homes and the sort of connectivity between sort of uh, patients that are in hospital at one stage and then back into care homes and in hospitals because um, just from a personal observation my mother died um, two years ago um, actually over at um, Newcastle and Cramlington and the biggest issue with her end of life care was the sort of there was a sort of understanding when she was in hospital of how um, the care was given to her and she was supposed to be sent back out to the care home but the care home immediately at any sort of sign of her coughing sent her straight back into the hospital Mm. setting which which isn't which to my understanding wasn't the correct um, procedure so it was great having protocols and, and great ways of handling people while they're in hospital but if there isn't that sort of link to the community setting or the care setting that they're sort of discharged to um it can break down and you can have such good work done in one setting absolutely annihilated by it sort of being and I mean admittedly there were sort of probably issues with staff understanding and sort of family understanding and they kept thinking traditionally the best place for my mother was to be sent back to hospital but to be sent into an urgent care setting uh, where she she died on a what really was an A&E ward in the end you know was wrong and despite all the staff's hard work and it was a shame for them because they did all they could everything broke down because of the the you know the sort of communication between the two care settings and I was wondering do you have some way of sort of preventing this happening um you know over here in our um area just it's just sort of out of interest really so whilst I could never say we could that something like that would never happen we have um Suzanne who's our wonderful lead Macmillan nurse um she looks after not just the in-hospital palliative care team, she looks after the community one as well. And Suzanne's background is as a, is, is a community nurse as well, so she understands community nursing. And it's probably one of the benefits of being quite a big integrated organisation. So Suzanne can influence the district nurses as well, because she works very close to Sharon Morgan, who I'm sure you've met, is our Associate Director of Nursing for Community. Um, so that helps us join the dots a lot better mm. and we would get even if that sort of incident occurred which is really sad that that did we would know about it and we would be able to take action the other thing is our palliative care consultants obviously work out in the community as well and we really lucky with the palliative care consultants we've got like you know I know if for instance if a, if a palliative um, or end of life patient does come to A&E it will get onto the radar of our palliative care consultants and they take it very personally and are very proactive about the action they take so I like to think that we do work really joined up and and if there was any incident like that happened um, that we would take action very swiftly to try and make sure it didn't happen again. Mm, Thank you very much Um, uh, I must say I did feel you know, I felt very, very sad uh, for the staff as well because uh, they were entirely frustrated by, you know, what had happened. But I think this sounds like you do have some sort of checks and balances on that. And I mean, I know you can't avoid avoid every situation, but, uh, you know, it is one of those like little pressure points where, you know, like just the information can sort of uh, be lost, you know, and and people's understanding of, um, you know, how palliative care is managed. You know, so I think if there is a close link like that with, you know, um, with your consultants out in the community, it does benefit because at least care homes will understand their role and you know and sort of how you know how to use services more effectively for everybody's benefit. So thank you very much for that, and good luck with the rest of that work. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Um, mortality can be pretty complicated, and there's a lot on this slide, so I will try and just draw out the the, the key points for you. So, there are a number of published indices. Um, as it happens when we're looking at Darlington Memorial Hospital, there are, um, all of those published indices would come out within what are called the as expected range. Uh, for the trust as a whole, the first one, the summary hospital mortality indicator is pushing a slightly above expected, um, mainly at, uh, at, at Durham. Um, we have had, therefore, an independent review of our um, whole sort of approach to mortality uh, and the assurances that we have from the Northeast Quality Observatory. Um, 
that I'm conscious of time, so I won't go into yeah. the technicalities. Their their headline opinion was that um, COVID makes the summary uh, hospital mortality indicator a lot less reliable anyway, um, and it's it's impacted other trusts. They say you should really rely on the fact that we are uh, doing large numbers of mortality reviews, over a thousand, as you can see, for 2021, um, and finding um, few serious lapses in care. And they regard, because they've reviewed, reviewed how we do it, they regard our mortality review process as being pretty robust and in line with good practice. So th that's all I would say on mortality, but I'm happy <laughs> if anyone does have no. a question. Anybody got any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, for maternity, um, those are the four things that we said we would do. Um, we're in pr a process of, of securing the fetal medicine consultant head of midwifery role as required by uh, the recommendations from, from the Ockenden review has been strengthened in terms of um, the, the position in the organisation and the way um, the head of midwifery reports both to the executive director of nursing and to our non-executive um, board lead for maternity services now with a minimum of bi-monthly meetings that they often do meet um, in between. Um, Staffing has been constantly reviewed at uh, different times uh, in the last year be because of sickness absence. Um, it has um, ha had some pressure. Um, the, uh, the overall picture, though, is that we've made use of every bit of national funding we can get and we're recruiting beyond our, our vacancy rate so that we, we build in more resilience in the service going forward. So the last data I saw was we had something like eight and a half vacancies and we were going to recruit about 20 uh, midwives. Um, in terms of continuity of carer, um, the the strategy at the moment has been uh, paused um, whilst we review and evaluate where we've got to with the, the first four teams. Um, it's still definitely the right direction of travel. The um, the national um, leads for the programme have, have looked at how we're doing it and they're very supportive. Um, but what we want to make sure is that we don't go at such a pace that we actually um, destabilise staffing on the labour wards and the acute hospitals because we that would be a, a very silly thing to do. Um, and given mm -hmm. that we have had some staffing pressures, we're therefore sort of going a little more cautiously than the original plan. Um, with with put checkpoints essentially where the, the um, maternity team are meeting with the executive directors to uh, make sure that we've got the right balance of staffing across all of it. Again, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? You got anything you want to add, Lisa? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, Excuse me. Pediatrics. Um, Again, the three things we said we would do there. Um, we uh, at Durham, we we've looked to extend the opening hours of um, the paediatric assessment area, which we have done. Um, it is subject to evaluation uh, at the end of March, um, but we were very hopeful that it'll absolutely prove the concept in terms of um, the work that it's doing, taking children away from from uh, from A and E. Um, so. We, we've got that one in place. We couldn't do that at Darlington. We said we'd look at the possibility. Um, we're constrained estates wise in terms of everything we need, the, the front of house footprint for particularly in terms of segregation for COVID. Um, but we've, we've definitely strengthened the competency framework and the training for any of our nursing staff that work within the uh, children's nurse, uh, nursing, air, children's A&E area at Darlington. Um, and we've actually increased the number of children's nurses that we have on the, um, have amongst the uh, the A and E offering and uh, strengthened the rotors. Um, we're working very hard as well with local authorities and also the with chief colleagues, some of whom I know are in the meeting, uh, and um, CNTW as well in terms of a partnership alliance approach um, for children and uh, focusing um, particularly on children and, and, and adolescents um, who have come to us with medical needs, but also mental health needs. Um, and that's starting to work really well in terms of an overarching approach, but also individual care plans um, that, that use all our services to deliver the best for those uh, young people. Again, happy to take any questions. Anybody got any questions? Is there anything you want to add, Lisa? Oh, OK, thank you. 
I know Lisa's going to say something on the next one. <laughs> um, so we we aim to increase excellence reporting. This is celebrating success and 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 building on success in the organisation. We do that through a trust wide bulletin. Uh, we've linked it to to to, to uh, compliments as well, and you can see that the trend is going up year on year. Um, so we're making good progress. But I know Lisa wants to say a bit more on this one. Yeah, I'll be brief because I am conscious of the time. But um, thank you. So excellence reporting is something that we're really trying to bring in as we uh, like really try to bring to the fore as we implement the new patient safety strategy, um, because. Obviously, we can learn from the bad, but we can learn from the good as well. And sometimes um, these excellence reports will outline an incident that if somebody hadn't done something excellent, an incident might have occurred. Does that make sense? So it's how do we take the information from these excellence reports and share it in such a way um, that we we can learn from them as well and, and, and learn from the good? Because actually, that's a really positive thing. We're linking this up a lot with something called civility saves lives and for any of you on social media you might have seen that's quite a big campaign around how actually if we're not nice to each other at times of pressure then that can actually cause incidents as well so so trying to push the civility and the excellence reporting is 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 pushing the positives which helps rather than just learning from the negatives when an incident occurs learn from the positives and, it, and it's a much better way to learn thank you any questions? No, makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. This is the last um, of, of the detailed priorities. Um, so, um, again, just to pull out the headlines of this in the interest of time, as you can see, we um, we've seen some a deterioration as um, demand at our front door has increased uh, in terms of patients seen within the the four hour waiting times standard. Um, but if you look at the table below in terms of um, what's clinically very important time to initial assessment, um, then actually we're getting that uh, getting the uh, percentage of patients through initial assessment within 15 minutes up month on month, um, which actually um, obviously drives the care that they receive in the A&E department. And then it's more about um, having beds available to get them out to that sometimes means that that doesn't translate in terms of what we do for the four hour standard. I've talked about the work as one initiative, which is really important in terms of what we're doing at the moment. It doesn't have an end date it started in December and it will go on until we've optimised our processes. Um, and there's a lot of work also being done across the whole system with with our primary care colleagues uh, and with the ambulance service as well, in terms of making sure we're all uh, doing the right thing to uh, uh, to to optimize uh, how we uh, look after the patients um, in terms of when they need to come into hospital but i'm happy to take any questions on that any questions on this okay. thank you okay so can you just come in there i mean there's a lot of criticism uh, about any waiting times as we all know um, particularly caused by covid um so whilst you are producing these kind of figures uh, is there any real effort going in to reduce those th those concerns and complaints? Um, the quoting figures, which is all very well and good, uh, yeah. which is fine, and I think we can understand where and what the problem has been caused by with this COVID that we've been going for the last two years. Uh, but it is, it is an important aspect, and, and, and you are taking a lot of stick about it from... Um, either be it on, on the, the national media, the local media, or people just around the streets. So it would be interesting to know just really what you are looking to do or trying to do to to improve the um, the shining hour. Yeah, so um, absolutely, there's, a, the, 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 there's no bigger focus uh, for anybody in the organisation than um, trying to um, it's not just improving um, the flow of patients through the department, improving performance against these indicators, it's actually making sure that um, we keep patients as safe as possible and um, deal with the, the, the impact so that um, we give them as good an experience as we can when we're in there. So making sure that they've got food and drink, et cetera. Um, we have a, a set of safety procedures and a checklist that we, we work through um, every hour to make sure that um, we're keeping people safe. Beyond that, there's been, um, I, th I think it's it's between 18 and 20 million pounds worth of investment 
um, that has been made in A&E services in terms of additional staffing and resources. Um, we, we, we have a, um, a, a, in, in the interest of time, I, I couldn't detail it, but we could send you something in writing that there's, there's a, a, a huge programme of work, not only through Workers One, but through something called our A&E system delivery group, um, which looks at every aspect in terms of um, whether people are going to the right place in the first place, whether they need to come to A&E, whether we're, um, we're then making the right decisions in terms of whether people could go home and admitting them, uh, how we are using our bed base uh, at the back of house, um, how we are creating um, space in terms of ambulance handovers uh, and result and making sure we've got the ambulance handover areas fully staffed so we get people off the ambulances um, as quickly as we can. Every aspect is is being looked at and it's not just um, uh, looked at internally within the trust. We we work through our local A and E delivery board who hold us to account on it uh, and hold other 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 partners to account for their actions as well. But I, if you wanted me to, I can say, share you a summary that's gone to our board um in writing and and I'm, i'd be happy to 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 get someone to come and have a further discussion about that at the next meeting it is an important one i think one Absolutely. of the issues one of the issues you mentioned which i think we all recognize is that there are more people going to any and not being a medical man uh, i can well imagine quite a lot of them ought not to go there but i think it's fair to say that one of the major problems now is um you know the difficulty people have seeing the general doctor in the general practice what, what's standing there and whilst we can always say well you know you've got to go through 101 i think if um when people wake up and they're not very very well or they're in pain or the wife or the children are in pain the obvious thing is you know we won't wait and if we can't see our doctor off we've got to wait to see our doctor for a week or a fortnight um and they are not all fair with 101 uh, then they will trip down to the a &E. and of course that must put all kinds of pressure on you sadly. Yes. So is, is there any thought or, I'd, or yeah, is, is that acknowledged as a problem and if it is acknowledged as a problem, um, because I mean let's face it, before we can solve anything we've got to identify what the problem is and I should imagine, I would suggest to you that it is part of the problem, not all the problem, and therefore, our, is it is it being looked at and people given a due consideration as to, you know, how can we overcome this problem? How can we direct people? How can we improve the situation where people can see the general doctor, the GP more easily? And failing that, more people are aware of the 101 service as a, as a, as a fallback rather than go into a and &E and, you know, clog it up effectively and give you all kinds of problems. Yeah, it, very briefly, it is, be, it, it is well understood. It's looked at. There are actions through the local A and E delivery board on primary care partners in terms of making sure that they they are providing as much capacity as they can to see patients. Um, there is evidence that they are, and they're doing better than other parts of the country for face to face appointments. There's uh, there are actions around communication through the hashtag Do Your Bit campaign, which is across the whole region. Um, and also actions in terms of uh, Darlington making the best use of the urgent care centre, which is GP supported and is co-located. And at Durham, we've now got a, a primary care hub right next to the A&E department there so that people can be referred into that if they can't see their own GP uh, or if they do turn up. But actually, GP care is enough. We can we can send them into that hub. So I, are you saying that uh, I'm looking at your <coughs> slide me. now where it says, uh, patients spending more than 12 hours in A&E from April 22 to October 520, which is astronomic leap. Are you saying that with all these things you're looking at, that figure should now come down? It should come down and it is starting to come down already, yes. Thank you. Okay. I think this is a problem that's been going on for some time. I, I mean, yeah. I've as a long-term member of this committee, I've been involved in several projects and I think it's fully understood it's just a question of getting the message across. Uh, so I think it would be useful if uh, there were some updates on this particular issue. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. 
if Anna wants to liaise with me when for when your next meeting, mm. I can um, yeah. arrange somebody um, mm. to, to talk to that. Mm. Very last slide I have, Richard, just um, for the record, confirms that these are the ones that we haven't covered, and it's essentially because we we are waiting the the data sources because they generally come from national surveys, etc. Um, otherwise, for any questions, but I think you've asked them as we've gone through. <laughs> And I'm sorry it's taken so long. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify the way forward here? Is it that you will require, are we having any further meetings to update on quality accounts or will we um, be submitting a report on behalf of the scrutiny committee as usual? Do you know, Hannah? We generally have another meeting. We we'll have um, another, another meeting. Okay. presentation. Okay. Yeah. okay, thanks, Hannah. I wasn't sure. So, um, just can I thank um, Lisa uh, and Warren for an excellent presentation? And I, I, I'm sure we'll agree that despite the challenges and pressures of the last year, progress is being made with uh, in many priority areas. And also, I think we should acknowledge the involvement of staff in developing initiatives themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Next item on the agenda. Would you, would you like to go? Yeah, are we okay yeah. to leave now? Yeah, yeah fine. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Bye bye. It is the TSS Gunway Valley Quality Accounts. Is that you, Chris? No. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's new, Hello. That's new, that's <laughs> sorry. And Jennifer. New, um, uh, Jennifer Ellingworth and Avril Ali, but I'm going to put the slides up on the screen for you. Okay, thank uh, you. Just to say, well, we, we know you're a little bit pushed for time, so we'll yeah. we'll do ours fairly quickly. Yeah, okay, thank you. Do you want, how do you want to deal with questions? Can we, can we take them at the end? Please. Please. At the end, okay, thank you. Yeah. Is that okay with everyone? Uh, yeah. uh, we'll just yeah. get that ah. back up. And thank you. So um, just while Chris is getting the slides up, just to introduce myself, I'm Avril Lowry. I'm the Director of Quality Governance at Juve. And my colleague, um, Jennifer Illingworth, who's the Director of Operations for the Durham and Darlington, is also um, presenting today. And Chris is going to sum up at the end. So um, without further ado, if we could just have the next slide, please, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. So just... Um, the presentation um, is going to give you an update on um, our progress against those priorities that we identified last year within the quality account. Um, normally, we would also think about the um, priorities for the coming year. Um, we're not as firmed up as sometimes we would be at this point, and I'll explain why as we get into the presentation. So some of that is not quite decided yet, but we're, we're making good progress. Um, and um, it was really just to point out that the data that's included in these slides and will be included um, it, when it refers to the trust data, it's for the whole of the localities. And when we talk about local data, it's County Durham and Darlington, County Durham as well as Darlington, rather. Just, just, so, just to clarify that from the beginning. OK, thank you. Great. So this is um, one slide really just to at a glance kind of give you an idea of the progress that we've made throughout the year. And as you can imagine, we've had two very challenging years um, within healthcare and I think within mental health context, some of the challenges are can be quite unique and, and different from those within within the acute hospitals, you know, impacting on um, you know, the mental health of people in our care, but within the community. And I think we have yet to see some of the longer term impact yeah. of that. Um, it can also, you know, have impact on our ability to, to be able to um, facilitate leave for patients who would normally have that. And uh, so it was just really uh, to say that despite all of that, we have really worked proactively um, to put the improvements in place and um, deal with the challenges that COVID you know, has presented um, and work to make improvements and keep people safe throughout throughout that time. So the three priorities that we um, highlighted were around um, care planning and um, improving the quality of care plans, having them co-created and personalised. Um, the safer care agenda was very much around looking at our journey to safer care moving forward. And compassionate care involved a whole range of different things, um, promoting 
if um, the culture values and behaviours that really enabled us to provide compassionate, empathetic care for patients um, throughout and families. So in terms of care planning, um, you may be aware um, that the, the, um, the care programme approach is being um, stopped, what, it's no, not, no longer going to be in, in place. Um, and the trust has been working for some time in anticipating you know, what that means for us as an organisation and for our patients' care and to find something that improves on that process. And we have had in our quality account for some time now care planning because we see it as a, as a real key component of quality and safety. We are disappointed in some respects that we haven't made the progress that we'd anticipated and mapped out as a timeline within this current quality account. We've had to move some of those timelines and extend them to quarter four. Um, however, what we've done in the trust more latterly is we've developed um, a PMO office, which is having really dedicated support um, and oversight around quality initiatives, um, around a range of things. And um, care planning is going to be one of the key areas that will be overseen by our, um, our board, our, our PMO board, um, project management board, to ensure that this gets the scrutiny, but um, is delivered um, within the, the set timescales that we set moving forward um, and to drive the delivery of that. So more scrutiny, more support to achieve these key things around care planning. So um, some of the work has been very much around what, what we plan to implement is something called Dialogue, which is a framework um, which is in an in, in electronic format and will be part of our electronic Care, uh, sorry, record of patients, but to enable that to go live, clearly there's the whole setup around educating people, um, helping people to understand what this looks like, but also it needed to be aligned to the go live with our CETO. Now, CETO is our new patient record system that will be replacing the one that we currently have. It's very complex in terms of getting that into place, and it has um, I suppose ramifications or uh, imp uh, implications, I would say, you know, for, for a wide range of things, which so has to be planned really carefully. We do anticipate that this will go live in the autumn of this year. So the work around care planning is very much with that timeline now in mind and doing all of that education, training and enabling work to help make that a success when we do go live. And dialogue really is a framework that encourages co-creation and family and patient involvement in the development of each individual patient's care plan. So moving forward, um, in terms of safer care, at this time last year, we had done some work around mapping out our safety priorities. And like Durham and Darlington Foundation Trust alluded to, our quality strategy was coming to the end of its um, time. Um, and during COVID, again, we extended year by year um, our work around what we were focusing on. Now we are looking at that quality strategy now that the Trust has launched its journey to change. Um, which is its overall strategy and will have different elements to it. One of those elements is our journey to quality and ultimately that is our quality strategy. Quality has three domains, patient safety, clinical effectiveness and the patient experience and we've made some way um, in um, prioritising the safety element and developing that up into some key areas for improvement and priorities. Um, one of the things within that was to um, look at the um, uh, having another family conference. Um, we'd had one previously where families had fed back around their experiences, particularly related to families who'd had um, someone, a loved one who had, had, had died now care. And we did a lot of reflection and we really wanted to understand it from the family's perspective and through their lens. And the first um, event was very helpful. We were going on to hold some more, but because of COVID and the restrictions that were in place, we weren't able to do that in that way. However, what we have done is a really good piece of work with families. 
um, and focused more on um, our serious incident review process. We'd had a lot of feedback from families in relation to how they'd found that process. So um, when um, someone had been harmed in our care, um, and that might have been that they died, they'd taken their own life, or they had some level of harm, um, and it had been um, categorised as a serious incident in line with the national framework, there's a set process that we have within the organisation to review those incidents to ensure that we learn and identify where there is any areas for learning to you know to, to put, build that into our improvement work moving forward to help prevent that from happening to others in the future um, but one of the key things that families were telling us is that they were confused they um, didn't feel as involved as they would have liked um, they weren't always clear about the purpose of the review um, so we did a lot of listening and then we got other stakeholders in um, to hear their views, people from the services, the patient safety team. And ultimately what we've designed is an improvement project that takes all of this into account and hopefully will give us an improved process moving forward where family voices will be heard in the report itself, um, as well as um, something that seems very corporate and trust driven. So we'll be able to keep you updated on the progress of the implementation of that action plan. And um, we've also secured funding for um, uh, a matron um, and a project matron to lead this piece of work so that we've got the dedicated resource to drive it forward. Patient experience was another focus and it was particularly focusing on patients feeling safe in our care. And we know that this is an issue for um, many mental health trusts and patients, particularly when patients are in an inpatient care. And it's a measure that we use within our patient survey. We've continued to measure that. And we've continued to look at the, the reasons why people tell us they don't feel safe in our care. And there's a range of things. So for example, it might be related to their own mental health condition at that time and exacerbated by that. It might be fear of other patients who um, are on the ward or in the area. Um, and we continue to understand that and put in a range of initiatives um, across the organisation and different wards um, to help address those. So some examples are um, better introductions when, when um, patients are introduced to the ward, um, meetings that uh, address this with patients to, to hear how they're feeling and, and, and feeding back their advice, their ideas into practice and changing our practices according to that. We've also linked it with CNTW who have the same issue and the objective of linking with them is to do some benchmarking against you know, what their patients are telling them about feeling safe, but also to share their initiatives in terms of improving um, care and this around this particular item. The next step is we're going to hold some focus groups with different patients across the organisation to home in on certain aspects to see what we can learn from that and move forward with that. Um, we've also focused on the friends and family test, which is the national mandated measure um, for NHS trusts. Um, and it asks patients to rate their carers good, uh, average and so on. We've averaged around 92% which actually we're really proud of that 92% would rate our care as great or excellent. Um, but we've been trying to drive towards a higher performance around that. And we've been working with um, the services to really do some drilling down of the data. And we triangulated it with other information that we've got from patients. So complaints and um, PALS information, um, and um, learning from serious incidents and feedback from families to, to develop some action plans to address that, which we think will ultimately have an impact on that overarching experience. And we will see through this indicator. And we've started to see this improve slightly, but we recognise that it might take some time. Um, some of the other things that we've implemented it very positively, um, we've implemented some new patient safety briefings so that when we've got immediate learning, when something doesn't go as planned, um, we recognise it immediately and we immediately do an assessment to think about, are we safe? 
Have we done everything we need to do at this point in time to ensure our patients and staff are safe? And how can this be shared across the organisation where it would be relevant? Um, we've identified and implemented a process for sharing and distributing that. And we're working further on how we revisit the briefings to get assurance that what we've put in place has had the impact that we wanted to. Another initiative around um, learning lessons. So there's been a big focus on organisational learning and you know, we're very much aware that um, you know, we can improve that position. How do we take learning from various sources and that could be patient safety instance, it could be from a patient experience feedback, etc. And how do we recognise um, where there is learning and where it could be useful across the organisation and get it to the people that need to, to change practice? So one of the areas is a bulletin that we've put in place that goes out after each serious incident panel um, to identify what learning could be uh, shared across the organisation and it's been implemented in a, share, a lessons learned bulletin that goes out on a weekly basis. Um, we've also um, have a patient safety campaign. So the whole purpose of the campaign is to raise the awareness of staff around everyone's responsibility to safety, no matter what their role is, and, and to raise and develop a culture of patient safety by thinking about patient safety first no matter what we're doing and that it's always there and it's a given um, and there are various things that we're doing we're raising profiles about various staff in the organization and what their role is and how they can support people in patient safety um, we are providing updates and some of the patient safety work so a whole range of things and we've most recently got our carers group involved in this work um, so the carers had identified where they felt they could help in terms of patient safety and they made some recommendations to us. So we're really, really keen to take them up on that offer. And one of the things they're helping with in the patient safety campaign at the moment is doing some interviews with different people across the organisation around patient safety um, and sharing that more widely. And so that's kind of the beginning of our journey around the carers involvement. Um, I've already mentioned the serious incident review project and involving patients, but looking at the process um, so that we have a really robust process moving forward. And um, in terms of complaints, we have implemented a new process to capture when we have informal concerns. So if someone raises a concern with a team or an individual, you know, we, we don't capture it in a, a systematic way. Now it will be logged into our complaints module within our electronic system and that we can look at trends around and um, things that people are raising with us informally. Um, and we could also use that data to think about has this helped us reduce the number of formal complaints? So this is um, in its early stages. It was built into our new policy. We're trying it out and introducing it gradually that we can learn about the implementation and um, not going not necessarily going big big bang with that so again and um, that's something that we will be monitoring moving forward and we'll say is a really positive thing i've mentioned the carers group and i've mentioned the policy so i think um in terms of compassionate care um this was based on some of the feedback we've had through our big conversation um and you know we've shared that really widely I think a key thing from that was around um, process before people, as we termed it. So, you know, Tuve had this real um, pride in developing really good systems and processes. And some of that was um, facilitated with the lean methodology. But sometimes that was maybe at the expense of um, you know, that more think, thinking about the patient within that. So I'm not saying that we aren't compassionate around patients, but there were opportunities to see it through the patient lens more and develop our processes that were more empathetic and not necessarily systematic. And complaints was one of the areas 
particularly um, the complaints team sat in my portfolio and we got someone external to come in who's part of a, a national expert who delivers empathy training. She, she delivered sessions across the whole organisation, thinking about people, about their personal, practising their personal lives and their professional lives, you know, what compassionate, compassion and empathy actually is and, and how we can build that into the way that, that we behave and um, we deal with um, big situations in our life and in our professional life, um, particularly with our patients. But in terms of the complaints team, we did some further bespoke training to think about how we could write much more compassionate responses. They felt very matter of fact um, and um, really lacked that empathetic approach. So um, Carolyn Cleveland, who's the lady I'm referring to has really helped to try to develop that um, and, and again that's a journey. She uses some really um, helpful techniques to get staff engaged and the training evaluated really really positively. Um, so I think that's been really really helpful in terms of um, you know how that's impacted on, on people across the organisation. We've got a range of different measures that we're going to be looking at at the end of quarter four to see how um, impactful this particular piece of work has been on those. Um, so, okay. Chris, the next slide, thanks. Yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a quick look at how we're doing against the quality metrics, and I think Jennifer's just going to give you. your comment on how Durham and yeah. Darlington's doing on some of these. Thanks, Chris, and I'll just rattle through these. I think um, Avril's given a, a bit of the story of some of these metrics anyway, so I don't need to focus on them too much. So the, the first number one is the percentage of patients who reported yes always to the question of do you feel safe on the ward? So you'll see that the far left hand uh, column there is a Durham and Darlington total for quarter three. So at Durham and Darlington we, we are at 71.17 percent against a target of 88 percent in the middle there. So as you can see we haven't obviously we're not quite at the target which is why it's red but actually we're doing better than the trust overall actual. So in Durham and Darlington, we're about 10% higher than everybody else, which is really pleasing to note. Um, but obviously, there's still work to do on that. And some of that, I guess, particularly in this past year, I don't want to labour on the point of the pandemic. However, um, the acuity on the ward, so the, 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 the acuity on all of our inpatient wards, particularly our adult wards, has been very high. Um, and there's been quite a lot of people who've been quite unwell. And sometimes that leads to people not feeling as safe as they might feel safe on, on award um, and, and, and other issues to do with that. But actually we're progressing in a in a positive way and we hope to try and uh, get a bit closer to that 88% target overall. Um, I'm not sure that we'll achieve that by the end of this year, but uh, hopefully we're in, a, we're in a stronger position than we have been in previous years. So it's positive, although, although red. The second one is about the number of incidents of falls um, level three or above. So they're sort of significant falls as opposed to a, a slight trip. Um, per 1,000 occupied bed days for our inpatients. So you can see again there we are green because the trust target is 0 0.35. We are at 0 0.23, so we are higher in this case than the trust average. But that was actually just due to one fall. So the, the, you, it, doesn't take a, it doesn't take big numbers to, to skew the data, I guess. Um, and that was in our older people's inpatient services. But I guess it just shows you in the comments there that we're doing some work at the moment to try and reduce to make the ward a bit of a less stressful place so we've got something called Cacadian lighting so we've managed to get some funding to do that so that is kind of like mood lighting and things which has been quite well evaluated in other areas um so we're, we're trying to use different ways to try and make the, the ward a little bit of a calmer environment and to try and make people um I guess less stressful when they're there from, from a patient perspective and then we've also got some um um initiatives for our nursing staff about how they manage uh, falls uh, and, and make sure that they promptly um, report things correctly. But I guess, I, I guess I'm from a, having worked in the Trust for about six years now, I think we're in a much better place as far as serious falls go than we probably were a few years ago where we had quite a lot of um, fractured necrophemas and things like that. And we, we don't seem to have that at the moment. Um, so I think the initiatives are take, taken uh, good hold now. The third one there is the number of incidents of physical intervention or restraint per occupied bed days. So again, um, 
the, the trust target is 19.25 there in the middle. Um, the trust actual is 25 and we're slightly under the trust actual, so that's good. But actually, this, there's always work to do to improve that. I guess the issues in Durham and Darlington for this particular metric have been about our adult learning disability services. So that's what the ALD stands for in the comments. And we've had a couple of particular patients who requires quite a lot of intervention um, and, and that has that has made the, our figures go up a little more than normal. So um, we obviously continue to monitor that, continue to do the best we can working with our patients uh, to try and make sure that any restraint or physical intervention that is undertaken is only when it's absolutely necessary for as short a period as possible um, and managed correctly. Thanks, Chris. So moving on to the next, so we've got the the percentage of patients who are on our CPA, so the care programme approach that Avril talked about a little while ago, who were followed up by staff within 72 hours after discharge from inpatient care. And you'll see um, the target for that is 80 percent and uh, we were at 90.17 percent. So that's really positive. Actually, I would prefer that it was 100 percent. And sometimes our data is not always quite right on this metric, particularly because because of the pandemic. Staff, um, just to give you an example, the patients who are discharged from inpatient care would normally be followed up in 72 hours by staff from the crisis team. Not always, but usually staff from the crisis team rather than the community team. But sometimes it's just the way that that metric is that it's about the way we recorded that. And if, it, if it's not pulled through from the crisis team, then it looks like that three days didn't happen in some of those cases. And actually, it probably did. Um, but we're always working to make sure that we've got the data as correct as possible. But still, that's a, a good, good metric and we're achieving over target in that one. The next one about the percentage of quality accounts audits completed. So number five, again, we've got achieved 100 percent of that. And that's, I guess, for, for those two metrics, so it's it, it just to note, they are trust wide targets. So that's not the Durham and Darlington figure because it's, it's, it's how it's, the data is pulled off the system. Um, but we're doing 100% anyway, so that, that's good. Um, next one, patients who occupy a bed for more than 90 days. Again, this is a trust-wide target as opposed to Durham and Darlington specific. The target is that it, people should be in beds for less than 61 days. Actual um, at, at the end of quarter three was 69 days, so that was slightly above the target. Um, we have had some pressures um, through the pandemic. It's it's true. It's fair to say, particularly in our older people services, where we've had some issues where um, some of our older people who are in our inpatient beds would naturally go back to care home settings, and some of the care home settings have been not would not been able to do that because the care homes have been closed for um, outbreaks, etc. So some of that has been the, there is some issues through um, older people moving through the system. Um, which is probably no dissimilar to our colleagues in acute trusts as well. So we're slightly above that target, but we'll be monitoring that carefully. And we do try really hard to move people on and out to where they should be as quickly as possible and not keep them in, in beds longer than they should be. OK, I think this is the last one for me. So the last one, these are all probably interlinked, so seven, eight and nine. So it's a percentage of patients who reported their experience as excellent or good percentage of patients that said that staff treated them with dignity and respect. And then number nine is people who would re recommend the service to friends and family. So you'll be familiar with some of these metrics because we've been doing them for a while. You can see the trust targets down the middle there. So and as you can see, Durham and Darlington on the left, we are we're red against all of them, but we're, we're fairly close as well and probably closer than we have been in, in non-pandemic times, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, so you can see, although uh, apart from the first one, where we're slightly under what the, the whole trust is doing, we're actually um, better than the trust average, I think. Um, or the, or no, we're not. We're not there, yes, we are uh, in the other two. So there are there or thereabouts. Um, so I guess it's pleasing to know the targets are set quite high. So they're 94% for those three metrics. But as you can see, we're 93.27, the first one. So we're, we're, we're there or thereabouts and just under 90 and then just over 90. So we are very close. And I know that when I've done these presentations in previous times to yourselves and, and under the um, local authority colleagues, we've always been a little bit under that. So I think we are making excellent progress. Um, and in lo the locality, particularly at the moment in Durban and Darlington, we have a focus on patient experience and trying to make sure that we, we we're asking those questions at every opportunity and trying to make sure that we put things in place to improve them. So I think that was the last bit of mine, Chris, or have I missed one out? No, I have. Thank you. No, no, that's, that's it now. Very quick. It seems like it's got to be very quick. So in terms of next year, as Avril said, 
um, we're not quite as far ahead as we normally are in terms of what we want to do next year, and some of that's for good reasons. Um, we've, as she said, we've set up a, a program management organisation and program groups. And our program, well, our, our, our program groups have actually got service users and carers, uh, a, a, a decent chunk of the membership, and we're actually working with them to think about um, what the priority should be for next year. Now, traditionally, some of you will remember we used to run a, a, a big engagement event, which is usually at Scotch Corner, actually. Uh, so not in Darlington, but not far away. Um, we're not sure whether it will be able to do that yet. So we've 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 kind of been holding off in the planning to see how how COVID goes, and we'll need to decide if we're going to do something online or something physical at some point in the sort of late winter, early spring, on on that, uh, which is where we'd invite Health Watch and and you know uh, over scooty chairs and and trust governors and so on. And finally, uh, after that. Um, well, this is all, but this is all subject to the national to the national guidance because of, um, in the last couple of years they've slipped the timescales for this. But at the minute, we're, we're presuming that as usual, you'll get a draft quality count somewhere around mid to late April, possibly early May. You get 30 days to return your comments and just to send back times because we, we we know that because of your municipal year, it's better to get things out in April if we can. So we will try and do that. Um, uh, people, you give us comments, they'll go into the appendix uh, as you wrote them. Uh, our board of directors see all of those and then they approve the final document in, in June and then we, we publish it. Just to say as well, we, we know that in the past you've said it's really not a very user-friendly document and we're really going to make an effort this year. We've got our comms team have agreed to come and help us to try and slim it down and make it more accessible and perhaps we might consider things like doing a, a, a kind of short summary as well. For, for, for people on it as well, uh, while still ticking on all the legal boxes, of course. And again, if you want us to come through uh, partway through next year and give you an update on how we're doing, we're, we're very happy to do that. So uh, thank you for bearing with us and we're very happy to take some questions. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Has anybody got any questions? Councillor Lee. It's not so much a question, it's a comment, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, I think you ought to be congratulated on what you're doing. I mean, the the uh, the uh, results are uh, incredibly high, and when we consider the uh, the fact that you've had COVID for the last two years, I think they're just absolutely remarkable. So I, I think you ought to be congratulated, and uh, and long may it continue. The only question, which which is a rather strange one, who who decides on the target figures? You know, when you've set 94 percent, it's such a, an unusual number. Is that sort of? <laughs> no, I won't. I won't say it's drawn out the hat. I know it's more, it's more complicated than that, but it's such an unusual number. It, it, it's, yeah. Is it done scientifically? Is it done? How is it done? Do you want me to take that one, Chris, or do you want to? Yes, go on then. Go on. I think we've had we've had those targets for a, a few years now, and I guess. They were done by looking at, I guess, they looked at the whole performance across the trust of where we were, and I guess it was where we aspire to be. So I, I don't know why. I know 94 is a bit of a weird number because you'd expect it would be like 95 or 100 or, or 90 or something a bit cleaner than that. So I think it was done with a little bit of science behind it, aggregating where all the localities were at the time and then where we should be. But I guess it is a bit weird, and I do thank you very much for your thanks because it's very much appreciated. Um, it's a bit weird for you to see a, a graph with sort of red boxes on when actually the performance is around about 90%, so you wouldn't normally see that. You, so I think sometimes we're a little bit harsh on ourselves in our trust and some of our target setting, and I think we've had those conversations before, but uh, I think it was done with a... With, with the best of intentions is that's where it's more of a reach a stretch target than a, a an actually you know it's not it's not a um it's obviously not a mandated target from the government or anything like that it's it's more of a aspirational this is where we think we should be because we think that this is what we see as excellent an excellent standard for our our services to achieve so but i absolutely take your point I was just going to add, if I may, yes, thank you. It was just, um, obviously, just to, to add to Jennifer's explanation is that where we use SPC charts, like hard data to measure some of it, I think some of the targets are, work, this is the science that Jennifer's re referring to, they look at this, what's statistically possible. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, how they generate some of these um, strange percentages. Um, so using data from previous performance, and looking forward, what would be statistically 
possible and I think that comes into it as well but I agree that you know achieving 92 percent you know we should be very happy that 92 percent of our patients are seeing those really positive things yeah thank you well very quickly as well Avril mentioned that um, we're developing a new uh, quality journey which is our, our quality strategy and so either this year or, or so probably this next time round we may decide to change what we measure because it's really important that we our quality account measures the same things that actually the organization as a whole thinks are important so we may be coming back next and Avril might have a different bunch of stuff that she's measuring but that that would be why if, if we do that Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Councillor Lee, is your hand still up? It is, but I'll take it down, Wendy. Hang on a oh. sec. <laughs> so you haven't got another question? No, 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 no. OK. Well, can I just um, thank Chris and, and, and Jennifer and Avril for their excellent presentation. Um, I think we should acknowledge that despite not always achieving the targets, that an excellent job has been achieved um, and we acknowledge that and in the face of uh, COVID challenges and pressures. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, my dogs. <laughs> could, could you excuse me one minute, please? Oh. Not, not poorly, is it, Wendy? I'm so sorry about that. Um, so the, the next item on the agenda is County Durham and Darlington Adult Mental Health Rehabilitation and Recovery. And that's Thanks. that you done. I'll that, Councillor. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll try it again, keep this brief because I'm conscious of time. Um, so uh, you, there's a paper that hopefully I, I trust everybody's had a, a chance to have a little look yes. at the report that we sent sent through um so i'll go through some of the headlines and then i'm more than happy to take any questions if that's okay so this um paper is about a proposal to reprovide our some of our inpatient rehabilitation beds from where they currently are which is primrose lodge in chesterley street um through to uh, a premises in shildon um, which you may or may not be familiar with. It was you used to be. We used to call it the crisis house in Children. So yeah. it's it's one of our. It's a two premises that's currently vacant at the moment. And I guess the the reasons for that are are are, are twofold. I guess one is and, and the main driver for this is patient safety. If um, I don't know if people know Primrose Lodge because obviously it's a, it's a, the other end of. Uh, of of your patch it's where I live rather than where you live um and, but I guess Primrose Lodge is an old um a, an old house it's a beautiful old building um but actually not really fit for purpose for modern healthcare needs um we've had issues there you know we don't we can't give residents um an ensuite bathroom like every other inpatient uh, facility that we have um there are issues with stairs everything's on the first floor so it hasn't it's not very good for anybody that has any access issues because you've got to be able to go up the stairs to the bedrooms um and generally because it's an old victoria it's it, it, it's essentially an old house that's been converted in into this and it's been there for a long time but it doesn't lend itself it has lots of um i guess from a patient safety perspective it has lots of ligature risks so things that we can't we can't change because the, the the building is so old so really it's about how we make this building or move this move um the building into somewhere that's more fit for purpose for the patients um so this the proposal has been it's, it's already been supported by the durham tees tees valley partnership board um and i guess the, the the point of bringing it to yourselves is just to outline the proposals for change why we're doing it and then the, there's a couple of recommendations at the end which i'll touch on so just as far as um the primrose lodge goes it's it has 15 beds at the, in, in primrose lodge and we are talking about a, a bed reduction so that when we when and if we move to through to the shildon property um they will go down to eight beds rather than 15 they will be eight 
ensuite rooms, um, as I've said, and it, it's a far more fit for purpose uh, for modern mental health uh, delivery environment. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry, my um, blah, 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 sorry, excuse me. So yes, yeah, so the reduction in bed. So what I was trying to yeah, what I was trying to get to. I've gone off on a, a bit of a tangent in my own head. Um, as part of the bed reduction, and um, we do know that when we've done some modelling of how many beds are filled, that we can actually uh, we we do believe we can manage with the seven less beds than we've currently got, and that is because we've got some we've had some funding to enhance the community rehabilitation team service. So and and that's already we've we've actually already started doing that in the background. So we've recruited to a more enhanced community rehab service. And that means that actually what we'd ideally like to is keep more people, let more people live in the community in homes and not in, in, a, in an inpatient bed for us. So that enhanced service will provide intensive, intensive home support to people to keep them in their own communities. And that will be a countywide service so that what it means is at the moment, because we have um, the beds in Primrose Lodge in Chesley Street, so it could be a resident from Darlington who needed that facility, but they're actually going to be in a bed in Chesterley Street, which I guess is a bit of a, a travel, isn't it, for families and for, for themselves. Actually, hopefully, that people in Darlington who need rehab in the future will either be able to go to this facility in Shildon, which is a little closer, but if ideally what would like is them to be supported at home by that, in, that enhanced community team. So that, that bit of work is already in train and that bit of work will continue regardless of the outcome, I guess, of, of this paper. Um, what else have I missed? Da, 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 da. Sorry, I had some notes and I don't know what I've done with them. I wrote, I wrote, I did write a list, so I do apologise. Um, so we think that we can manage within the, you know, we've done a lot of modelling work. So we think um, COVID, like everything else, has skewed the numbers a little bit and it's maybe delayed some people moving on and out. But actually, we think going back to pre-COVID numbers that we can manage with, with the reduction in beds with that enhanced community support. I guess it, it 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 is meeting the needs of what we're working towards the community mental health framework, which is very much driving um, enhanced community support and less in less reliance on inpatient beds. So it, it I kind of it, it's moving in that general direction of tra of travel anyway. Um, and I guess the thing that we're asking, I guess, of the the of, of the group is to receive and note the paper which again I'm sure that you've read with with the, the additional detail that it's got in so it's to move from Primrose Lodge to Shildon with a reduction from those 15 beds to eight beds the bit that I've missed out which is now it's just come back into my, my mind is the fact that we do also have Willow Ward in West Park so we do have another rehabilitation ward in West Park in Darlington a 15 bedded unit um, so the, the, it won't be that we only have eight beds in the locality, it's just we'll, re, we'll reduce the, the second provision. Um, some of our other localities uh, in the Trust have actually are actually have, have actually gone down to sort of about 15 only in total. So we've still got more provision than other places. And actually we'll probably look in the future to try and, 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 and sort of manage those eight beds down so that we'd only have Willow Ward. But at the moment we know that we're not quite there yet. So this is kind of like a halfway to, to get into that point. Um, we are going to do some further targeted stakeholder engagement over the next couple of months. And what we'd like to do is come back to yourselves um, in March, April time with the results of that engagement and sort of give you our firm plans for what we think and how we're going to move forward with some timescales. So happy to take any questions. I know that was a bit of a, um, a rattle through a long paper. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? No? Anybody got from the trust got any further comments? No. OK, so um, can the members agree that we receive uh, and not the proposal um, and that we ask the um, trust and the CCG to come back to us when they've finished further engagement to give us details of the outcome? Yeah, can you agree that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks um, very much. I think that's the last item on the. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm doing this on my mobile phone. I do apologise. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, Chair, that is everything on the. Is agenda. that everything? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Um, and um, Hannah, would you be able to talk to the chair about the trust and the CCG coming back about this issue? Yeah, I will do. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much, Thank everybody. You.